Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight's Skillshare is called Planning for and Welcoming Neurodiver Neurodivergent, uh, it's quite a mouthful, um, museum visitors. Uh, my name is Laura Santoyo and I serve as the secretary for National EMP. I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to share with you if you were not already aware that NEMPN does have a um, new membership platform called the Mighty Network. Um, feel free to look us up. Um, we invite you to join us on there. Um, on there, you're gonna find a discussion board. Uh, that's where we also post internship and job postings. Um, we have a review of museum studies programs and a ton of other resources and it's all for free. Um, so I can drop that link in the chat shortly. Um, but if you want to look us up too, it's just called the Mighty Network, and you can just look up National EMP. Um, some quick housekeeping rules before we begin. This presentation is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to be visible on the recording, we won't take offense. Um, you can turn your video off. I see most of you already have it off. Um, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, probably in a couple of weeks. Please keep yourself on mute for the length of the presentation. That's just so that you can all hear the speaker. Um, and if you have questions, that's fantastic. Um, you can either wait till the end um, or you can drop your questions in the chat for the Q&A session at the end. I'll be kind of in the comments moderating. So if you have questions, um, I'll read them off. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, I know Madeline uh, Smolars from her involvement. Um, with the group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals, or GO EMP Committee, and also the National EMP Network. Um, she's a true leader in the field and an advocate for EMPs, and I feel very privileged to know her and work with her. Um, and Madeline, um, I know you wanted to give a little bit more of a background on yourself, so I think I'm just going to let you take it from there. Awesome, thank you so much, Laura. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to begin to share my screen. So sit tight, everybody. I have a beautiful PowerPoint and other things prepared for you this evening. So um, if you haven't got a uh, other device near you or a browser open on your um, device, I encourage you to do so because I will ask you to participate um, in two different platforms this evening. So if you're cool with that, get that ready while I'm getting ready. All right, I'll share my screen now. I think we're just going to do the whole desktop. Why not? You might see yourself for a real quick second, but that's okay. All right, and I am now sharing. Fantastic. All right, so this is my presentation this evening and I'm gonna make it nice and big and easy to see. Beautiful. I will be toggling back and forth a little bit between the PowerPoint and other things. So I'll always let you know when that's going to happen. Don't worry. And you'll know exactly what is going on because I have an agenda for us this evening. Um, I plan to speak for about 50, five zero minutes or so um, with a little bit of cushion time, of course, for questions and such at the end, uh, just to give you a bit of an idea about what to expect. So uh, thank you, Laura, again, for that wonderful introduction. This presentation is called Planning for and Welcoming Neurodivergent Museum Visitors. Uh, my name is Madeline Smolars, and I am presenting this Skillshare session, that's a mouthful, for the National Emerging Museum Professionals Network, or NEMPN. I did wanna share with you a little bit about myself. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I have a bachelor's of arts from the University of Ottawa and a master's of museum studies degree from the University of Toronto. I am a Canadian, yes. Um, I am currently working full-time as a museum assistant with the city of Kingston's heritage services department. I do work for a municipality and I've been in this role for just over three years now. I have a couple of other roles uh, out and about in the community. I'm a professional development committee member with the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries and Historic Sites or CAM here in my town. As uh, Laura mentioned, I'm also involved in the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals or GOEMP committee as chair. And I am also administrator of Emerging Museum Professionals Canada or EMP Canada for the French. 
and I am a program advisory committee member for the Algonquin College Applied Museum Studies program. I'm very passionate about um, student issues, particularly um, museum study students. And I did work with Laura and the crew uh, with on NEMPN's board of directors as uh, now I'm a former regional director of international and multi-location. EMP. So I just wrapped that up last month, but I just can't quit and hence I'm here today talking with you all. This is our agenda for the day and I alluded to this in the description for this Skillshare this evening. To lay it out very clearly, first we're going to talk about defining neurodivergence. Then we are going to uh, examine neurodivergence from my perspective a little bit, and I'll talk to you about what it's like to be um, neurologically diverse as a museum worker and as a museum visitor, because museum people visit museums and I can't keep myself away. <laughs> um, then we will go through a number of case studies around different areas of museum work then together do some activities to start you thinking about how you can implement some of these learnings in your own workplaces or studies or places where you volunteer. I will wrap things up with a sharing of resources because I definitely want to empower you to continue to learn about this topic following this presentation. Then we will finish with questions. Um, I would love it if you could please pop questions into the chat as we go along or the Q&A feature, whatever you prefer, um, because I know I would definitely get distracted if I was answering questions at the same time and that'll just help me keep my rhythm keep on time and that'll keep everybody happy Alrighty, I do want to start with a disclaimer folks you saw my degrees I am not a medical health or a mental health professional um, I would like to always tell I always want to tell people to definitely speak with a professional um, and with accredited experts to complement your basic learning when you are pursuing further learning and then getting to work on a project that will be experienced by neurodivergent folks. Um, I can't stress this enough. This Skillshare session is meant to be just an introduction. It's not supposed to be an exhaustive guide. Uh, it's supposed to be kind of light and fun and more easily digestible than um, what you might get from professional accredited experts. Uh, thank you so much for being here, of course. I hope you don't feel like you were duped, uh, <laughs> that I'm not a, a medical health or mental health professional. Hopefully that was clear in the description. All right, off to the races. Let's get started with defining neurodivergence. <clears throat> now, the Cambridge Dictionary, and you can look this up online, of course, I did give the URL there. Um, the Cambridge Dictionary defines neurodivergent or slash neurodiverse, I kind of put these two terms together, as being defined as having or related to a type of brain that is often considered as different from what is usual. Uh, I kind of use my own air quotes there. For example, that of someone who has autism or is you know, on the autism spectrum because autism is a very beautiful wide range of um, experiences and differences in the brain. Now, this is only one interpretation, one definition. Um, the more neurodivergent folks that I speak with, um, the more I find that each person kind of has their own definition and that's fascinating. It does speak to the diversity of neurodivergence out there and different experiences that people have along the way. Now I'm gonna use a bunch of different words today. You know, there's neurodiverse, neurodivergent, neurodiversity, um, neurodivergent itself. Like all of these words all kind of sound the same, all refer to the folks that we're talking about today. Um, they're all just different expressions of that word. So I just wanted to lay that out for you all. Now, neurodivergence does include, as I mentioned, autis autism spectrum disorder or ASD for short, as well as many, many other things. And I list just a few here. So uh, acquired brain injuries, such as concussions, learning differences such as dyslexia, vestibular disabilities such as Meniere's disease, attention disorders such as attention deficit disorder or ADD, mental health conditions such as schizophrenia, and much more. You may even identify um, as a neurodivergent person and may not be included in this list. Please don't be offended. I only had so much room on this slide, um, but I have the and more as 
a suggestion that there is a lot more than what can be contained in this slide. So please keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, I did want to explain a little bit, um, you know, the prevalence of neurodivergence as well. If you want to look at autism spectrum disorder on its own in Canada, and I apologize, this isn't a USA statistic, um, but where I am in Canada, one in 66 people is on the autism spectrum. Um, and that could be a whole wide range of different experiences and differences in their brains. Um, that's a rather large number of people. And then when you look at all the other different types of neurodivergence that people can have, and remember that people can have more than one type of neurodivergence. So for example, I have a vestibular disability and I also have a mental health condition. Those things intersect and interact with each other and create a whole new beautiful brand of neurodivergence. So um, there's a, a lot going on out there and it's definitely more than just, you know, one in 66 people or whatever the statistic is for your region. Um, it's definitely very prevalent and neurodivergent folks are everywhere. You likely work with some. They're coming into your museum. They're in your place of study. Um, they're at the coffee shop. It doesn't matter. Um, we're everywhere. And and uh, I want to help you all better learn how to plan for and welcome them um, in museums, wherever you may be. Alrighty, <clears throat> pardon me. So my brand <laughs> of neurodivergence um, is actually undiagnosed. I created this video back in, um, goodness, 2015, but my experience goes back to 2014. Um, I was kind of neurotypical up to that point, and I was basically caught a virus, uh, very similar to the flu, but when the typical flu-like symptoms left, I was left with brain damage uh, and nerve damage in my brain uh, connected to my vestibular or balance system that, uh, made it pretty hard to function. It basically, if you wanna put it in a word, it's dizziness. So I did create a simulation actually for a project during my master's degree and created a, a simulation of what this was like. This video is only about 40 seconds long. Um, I'm not even sure I can watch it for that long, but it basically replicates what it is like to have an acute experience of my disorder. So um, since 2015, my disorder seems to have evolved and changed a little bit. I did get up to a plateau of a really high function, but I've been having these pretty significant dips in my vestibular ability. So I'm currently being reassessed and it could be one of many things, but so far specialists generally agree that it is some sort of vestibular disorder. I am going to play this video. Um, if you experience car sickness, uh, if you yourself have a vestibular disorder, um, if you generally don't like those movies when the camera is shaking a lot, uh, this may not be for you. So feel free to look away. Um, I'll probably only play 20 to 30 seconds of this. So hang on. I just know from my experience and from showing this to other people, it's not very pleasant to watch at all. Alrighty, here we go. This is terrible. Well, that's only seven seconds. <laughs> so I'm looking side to side a little bit. There's a kind of like a bouncing happening when I walk, which is making me feel dizzy. It's making me feel nauseous. You can hear my breathing is shaky. I just don't feel very good. Oh, this is terrible. That was 30 seconds and I think that's enough. Um, <laughs> my goodness. So this is what I have shown specialist to demonstrate what I'm experiencing. Um, and it has helped a lot. It has actually helped a lot of other people as well. Over 24,000 views on this video to date on YouTube because I did make it public just for fun. And a lot of comments of people saying how much this helped them, you know, be able to share with their loved ones and with their medical health professionals what's going on to increase understanding and maybe get to a diagnosis, even if they don't have vestibular neuritis specifically, which is what I thought I had, definitely something going on with their vestibular systems. So that's a little bit of a walk in my shoes. I apologize if that was hard to watch. It was hard for me to watch too. <laughs> that's why I only played 30 seconds. So I'm gonna try and move on from this slide now. 
Oh, and it's going to want me to play the whole darn thing. Can I go, please? Hmm, I'm going to click the next at the bottom. No, nope, we're done with that. There we go. Awesome. That was kind of heavy. I wanted to lighten the mood a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm a millennial. Sorry. Here are some memes. <laughs> Here are some memes for you. These just made me laugh because uh, honestly, if you can't laugh at yourself and what's going on um, with your brain, then you, you can be in a pretty dark place. So I like to try and laugh at myself and, uh, you know, brush it off as best as I can. Um, because at the end of the day, it uh, laughter is, I'm going to be cheesy. Laughter is really good medicine. So um, I hope that these make you smile and uh, make you think of cartoons of days of old if you are quote unquote, older like me, a, a millennial. So on to the next slide. So just wrapping up this section a little bit, I did want to give you a couple points about what neurodiversity is like for me, uh, from my perspective as a museum worker and then as a museum visitor. So pivoting from kind of looking at walking in a neurodiverse person's shoes to then what is it like for them in museums as well? kind of going from more broad to specific. So as a museum worker, um, I definitely need an ergonomic workstation because poor posture leads to a bunch of issues with my muscles. And then that kind of triggers my vestibular issues. Uh, when things get tight and angry, it definitely makes me more dizzy. Don't ask me why, <laughs> um, but it basically sends signals to my brain um, that makes it even worse, um, my situation even worse. I definitely need a little bit of time each day for vestibular hygiene. That's been really hard lately because I'm doing the work of multiple people as a lot of museum people do. But even just having the flexibility to step away from what I'm doing for five minutes to do different stretches and head uh, and eye movement exercises to keep my vestibular condition good is very useful. Limiting screen time, that is hard right now as well. Um, a lot of digital paperwork is required in digital meetings, um, but even being able to look away from a screen in a meeting or you know, turn my screen off or just turn away from it for 20 seconds every 20 minutes, that does help a lot as well because too much screen time, the light certainly impacts me. It gives me a bit of a headache too. Um, opportunities for decompression quiet time, you know, time away from my coworkers. We shouldn't be that close right now anyway for COVID, but just having a room where I can go and close the door and take a little bit of time is very important. When I'm having a flare up or an acute situation, um, I've gone into a supply closet and laid down, uh, but my coworkers are very cool with that. They made me like a nice little bed that time. So um, just having a space at work to go and time to do that is very important as well. If I do have a very bad flare up, I do end up needing time off for some sort of care, whether it's you know a massage, chiropractor, acupuncture, physiotherapy appointments, appointments to see my family doctor. Um, it does make it tricky. And so it's helpful to have a workplace that is okay with those types of things and offers some flexibility and understanding. And then of course, on the diagnosis journey, time off for tests and specialist appointments. So that has been an ongoing thing lately, especially as hospitals up here keep pushing back general care because of COVID-19 demands on the healthcare system. Um, but I'm lucky at least I have had some tests done and now I'm just waiting on specialist appointments. Now as a museum visitor with a vestibular issue, I hate things like uneven floors. Um, I, I'm already kind of feeling unsteady, so that doesn't really help. Um, escalators and elevators are actually a little bit better than, than stairs sometimes. It depends on how I'm feeling, but it's great to have an option if you can offer it. Even just as an, a, a, a simple accessibility thing for someone who's using an assistive device, um, not just someone with a vestibular condition. You know, things like escalators and elevators and lifts are generally amazing as well. Just please know that even though I may not have an um, an assistive device, I might want to use one of those things. Railings are awesome because uh, they give me an opportunity to kind of stabilize myself. That's so helpful. And honestly, I think it's helpful for anybody who feels a bit unsteady, um, young or old, it doesn't matter. Very good accessibility feature. 
Um, if things are too bright or too dark, I can find it kind of hard to adapt quickly. So quick changes in light um, or just general darkness or too much brightness can be a bit disconcerting. Um, a lot of people is hard because people move. <laughs> um, so having maybe you know, caps on visitation or making sure that tour groups are smaller, that definitely does help me. Um, and I do have to kind of work myself up to being in busy museums. Anything that has moving components like videos and such, I often can't engage with for too, too long, depending on how significant those movements are. I love me some seating against walls because again, similar to railings that I can hold on to and stabilize myself, it's great to be able to sit and have my head leaning back on something for a couple of minutes because again, that kind of stabilizes me and makes me feel like I'm against something firm and it can make my brain better realize where I am in space. And then just in general, yeah, quiet, not very busy spaces. Um, these are things that I look for as a neurodivergent museum visitor with my brand of neurodivergence. And so I thought it might be helpful to um, inform your knowledge of that a little bit and tell you my lived experience of this topic as well, um, because sometimes the best thing to do is to talk to someone about their lived experience to hear it firsthand. Alrighty. So moving on to some case studies, um, let's dive into that. I think I'm fairly on time so far. Heck yes, that's pretty darn good. Okay, um, so case studies. I'm gonna be looking at um, four big ones this evening before we move on to activities. And I've grouped them into, um, or sorry, I've classified them rather under four general headers of museum work. Now, museum work is incredibly broad and incredibly multidisciplinary. Um, I don't mean to, you know, put collections managers down by not featuring them specifically here, but I'm trying to show different areas of the museum visitor experience. So even though I may not mention collections management, please know that I think about them in working with, you know, exhibitions and curators developing those things, um, because they're the ones giving input into how the artifacts are being displayed and things like that. So I'm definitely not meaning to cause offense to any museum worker who is not mentioned specifically or their milieu, their area of expertise is not mentioned specifically. All right, fantastic. Um, so first up is museum communications, marketing and digital experiences. I'm going to be honest, these case studies are a little bit of a love letter to Canadian museums, specifically um, the four that I've chosen. I love I love all museums, but for the purposes of this, I'm mostly familiar with Canadian institutions. And for those of you who are, are in the US, I thought it would be kind of fun to um, maybe hear about some institutions that you don't know about. The Agnes Etherington Art Center is a medium sized university affiliated art institution in my town currently, Kingston, Ontario. Um, they are the art gallery, essentially, that is associated with Queen's University, um, which is a well-regarded university here in Kingston and in Ontario, and frankly, I would say all of Canada. Um, really beautiful place with a great arts focus. So I am going to take you to their website, um, but before I do so, because I want to make sure I hit all of the things I want to say, I picked the Agnes because, um, well, I am friends with their, um, their person who does all of their digital, but I really love the fact that their website is incredibly immersive. Um, it is very smooth. Any sort of visual transitions that happen are very smooth. Um, they have Anytime there's videos, you know, there's caption, they have specifically digital experiences that are optimized for digital. And so they're incredibly inclusive and um, easy for people to experience regardless of their level of neurodivergence or if they are neurotypical. Um, if I say neurotypical, that basically means folks who are not neurodivergent and would be considered as having a quote unquote, you know, normal or more common type of brain experience and brain chemistry. Um, so yes, sorry, I didn't really mention that earlier. So um, I'm going to take you to the Agnes's website, but I would really encourage you to also check out their different social media channels, because I would say that what I've mentioned about their website and their digital experiences would 
go across their marketing um, digitally. And anything that I've seen is very, um, very accessible for folks who would be considered as neurodivergent. Now this is where the fun is going to happen and I'm going to pivot from the PowerPoint to the internet. So please bear with me. I'm going to escape from sharing this and because too many tabs is overwhelming to me, I'm just going to open up a fresh one. All right. So beautiful. Hopefully you can see my screen and all of my great tabs at the top, <laughs> my safe bookmarks. It's pretty boring. A lot of social media and banking and life stuff. Um, so this is the Agnes Eddington Art Center's website. You can see that the transitions that are happening on the screen are not very drastic. The images are staying up for long enough that I can, you know, engage with them, read any words that are there. Um, I would like to give a shout out to the font that they use even is um, sans serif largely. There's only like a small serif, which means that there aren't a lot of flourishes on the font. And that makes it so much easier to read um, for, for really anybody um, who would consider themselves neurodivergent and for those who have visual difficulties as well. Just a shout out to, um, to those folks, visually impaired folks. I also want to mention just the structure of everything that they do digitally is so straightforward. Um, basically, any questions that you may have as a visitor are immediately answered just with a simple little flick of the scroll. Um, so right away, they're giving me information about visiting. And it's also the first thing that I see when I look at the top bar. And even when I hover over visit, oh my gosh, the main screen darkens. And then this beautiful tab comes up that, wow, shows the weather. That's brilliant. <laughs> the date. And if they are actually like currently closed at this particular time that I'm visiting the website, then it breaks down all of the great things that I want to know about what it would be to be a visitor. And this goes across this lovely top bar. Um, there is an explore tab, so I can check out a lot of things online even before I go. There is a participate tab, so if I want to participate in a public program or education program, I can learn all about that, very easy. Connect, this is a little bit more um, about the Agnes, uh, reading news stories, contacting the Agnes, all makes sense for the word connect. And then digital Agnes. Oh my goodness. Shout out to my friend Danuta, who is in this picture uh, showing off a really cool digital tool that she created. But this is really the big highlight that I wanted to, to shout out the, the Agnes for um, is that they have things like online exhibitions, digital publications, interactives, audio, video. This is all so accessible for neurodivergent folks because if you're having a bad day but you still want to engage with an institution i don't even have to leave my home and this is all very easily accessible and friendly to my experience um, instead of you know going into all of these different tabs we've got a lot to get through so i'm not going to dwell too long on this i'll just scroll a little bit more down the agnes's page before we move on Again, very, very wonderful things coming up as I'm scrolling. Um, go from you know information about visiting to featured events. So if I just want to engage in a featured event, what is going on? Um, and it looks like it's very, it's perfect for not only children, but also for adults. Like you can see that there's a child right away. And that could be really helpful for parents of neurodivergent kids, knowing that things are child friendly. And then you can dive in more um, about what it would mean for your child to engage in this institution. And then, yes, there's some fantastic news, which will probably entice me to join a little bit more. But then there's a shout out about a digital thing that they have going on, a podcast. Podcasts are rad because I don't even have to look at anything. I can actually shut my eyes and listen. And I think, you know, having something that you engage with in a less kind of like confusing way and a less um, complicated way for neurodivergent folks is very helpful. Videos are good, especially like, you know, closed captioning and everything. 
But if it's a video that is silent with closed captions, that's great because my ears get a break. I'm not getting overstimulated. And then as well, if it's a podcast, I just have to listen and I could do something else. Um, and, or I could close my eyes if my eyes, my brain need a break that way. So shout out to the Agnes. And then yes, they kind of, you know, show some more things that they have going online. I know that they've worked really hard on this um, because of COVID-19, obviously, but I just, I'm very proud to have the Agnes in my town and wanted to give them that shout out today. So well done, Agnes Eddington Arts Center. Alrighty, I'm going to close that and keep on presenting. Beautiful. Um, in my case studies, I do try and look at different sizes of institutions and ones that are affiliated with different organizations and also have different focuses. So that's why I um, have this list of what kind of example each case study is. Alrighty, moving on. I think I'm doing fairly well. Um, exhibitions. Oh my goodness. So many fantastic uh, exhibitions for neurodivergent folks out there that are neuro friendly. Um, but I do want to shout out the Royal British Columbia Museum. It is located in Victoria, British Columbia on um, Vancouver Island, out on the West Coast here in Canada. They are a large sized provincial or USA lingo kind of state uh, encyclopedic institution. They are fantastic. I visited them a couple years ago and I certainly hope to go back in the future. Um, they have an exhibition that is, I believe it is currently there and they are either open or are opening extremely soon um, as COVID-19 restrictions change in that province. I'm not as familiar with British Columbian um, restrictions, but let's grab that URL and look at an exhibition that is called Orcas Our Shared Future. Alrighty, see the play. There we go. Awesome. So because we can't go to this exhibition ourselves, I just am going to feature the exhibition page um, because they already demonstrate and show many ways that they are catering to neurodivergent visitors on this page. So here's the lovely description orcas our shared future exhibition on now right away prompt by tickets well done marketing team <laughs> um and then as we go down a little bit further we don't get too far i don't have to scroll very far until i see some awesome stuff like braille reader files so basically files that you can download and print that is readable to folks who can read braille um, who may be visually impaired or just can read braille and find that much easier than actually reading words in the exhibition. There's also a printable activity sheet, which is really helpful for um, kids who are neurodivergent, who need something to kind of focus on or to keep them calm in a place that might be a little bit busy. So printable activity sheets that you can do at home if you're not quite ready for a visit or bring with you for your visit, that is super duper mint. And then we go down a wee bit more and there is a virtual tour. So there's a preview that you can take a look at. And then if you want to, instead of coming in person, you can actually purchase a virtual tour, which for some folks, um, if there's a long string of bad days, um, that might be a lot easier. Or maybe you want to take the virtual tour first before you actually want to go in person um, just to feel like very comfortable and very safe about the environment that you're stepping into. Um, so I'm going to go down to a slight bit more. And then there's a video at the bottom, which I really love. They actually have an artist who participated in this exhibition and created pieces for this exhibition talk about his work. And that's just an incredible other learning technique um, that is embedded into this page to help people understand the exhibition and what it is all about. So we've got different ways of teaching people about the exhibition here and different ways of experiencing it as well. You'll notice that there are some beautiful photos here. And I want to highlight um, one in particular. It may take just a moment to load. But there are things in this exhibition that you can actually 
touch and sensory friendly things, um, things that you can engage with, with touch, with, you know, not just seeing and hearing, but other senses um, that are accessible to you. This is really helpful for neurodivergent folks because it allows us to kind of switch modes a little bit and experience something in a different way than we are often forced to experience it. So, you know, exhibitions can be really text heavy. Well, my eyes get tired and um, it can be a lot and very taxing. But if there's something that I can touch and kind of take myself out of that reading pattern for a little while, um, that can be incredible. This is also such a great teaching tool for kids, whether they are neurodivergent or not, because um, tactile learning is very, very powerful. And it can give such a deeper understanding than just, you know, talking to them about it or having them read something. So um, there's also a beautiful photograph on the RBCM's Instagram of a visually impaired person who I believe may also be hearing impaired, experiencing the exhibition by touching um, these different components. So uh, I just yeah, I want to go fly to British Columbia and see this show because it looks incredible and that they put a lot of care and thought into making it a neurodivergent friendly experience. Um, a couple other things that I'll mention about this show, it definitely looks like, yes, there may be some dim areas, but it's a good mix of, you know, light and dimmer areas. There's nothing that is super duper in your face. Um, I'm sure I would also see that if I took the virtual tour too. Um, there, as I said, are touch components, hopefully there's straightforward language, um, maybe even a couple decompression areas and clear paths as to how you get through the exhibition. Well done, RBCM. I really would like to see this. If anybody goes to see it, please do let me know. So I, again, I'm going to go back on over to my presentation. Nope, that's the wrong one. I'm getting distracted by all the buttons. So that is um, a, a larger institution take on um, a neurosensory friendly or neurodivergent friendly exhibition. So go check out the RBCM. Now for education and public programs, I wanted to bring it back here to my province of Ontario and talk about the Ontario Science Centre. Now this is Actually, I lied. I was going to do another example. So this first bullet is slightly incorrect. It's actually more like a medium to large sized um, provincial or state science institution example. So apologies for the little bit of a mix up there. So the OSC is definitely a decent sized organization. Uh, they are independent but affiliated with the province of Ontario and they are all about science. They have an incredible program that's been running since 2018 in partnership with an organization in Geneva, Switzerland, actually, called Sensory Friendly Saturdays. So before COVID-19, uh, this was a series of family friendly programs that included an open house of their planetarium. So instead of, you know, the usual neurotypical uh, 40 minute long planetarium presentation, they modified that experience so that people can basically come and go as they please, ask questions along the way, basically make the experience far more customizable to their experience and what their comfort level was. Um, they also had, you know, researchers there if anybody wanted to participate in research to help gather more data on autism spectrum disorder or ASD, which I thought was such a cool partnership. Not only are they partners partnering, partnershiping, oh my goodness, partnering with folks in Geneva to make this the best programming possible, but they're also bringing in an autism research center to talk about scientific research and then have some people participate if they would like as well. And then another wonderful thing that they have is a comprehensive story booklet available in advance that accompanies the program and explains the expectations, you know, explains what people will experience when they get there. It has everything from, you know, what admission is like to any temperature changes that people may experience as they're going through the program. All of this is incredibly helpful. You may think that this is too much information, but for a neurodivergent person, this is incredibly helpful because, you know, some of these changes that neurotypical folks may think are no big deal or they just experience without even thinking, it can definitely throw us off. 
Now, during COVID-19, um, I do have the URL there, which I encourage you to check out. I'm not going to click it because it gets a little taxing going back and forth between uh, presentation and uh, these URLs. But uh, the OSC has moved Sensory Friendly Saturdays to online. All of their events happen online, either, I believe it is through Zoom, they record them just like we're recording this presentation and then they make them all available for free and the program is free too if you actually participate live they make them available for free on this website um, you know the sensory friendly saturdays page on the osc's website um, it is a fabulous resource not just for neurodivergent folks but also for caregivers, parents, loved ones of folks who are neurodivergent. Uh, they talk about so many different topics. I can't even list them all, but I really encourage you to check it out if you're looking for inspiration for uh, neurodivergent friendly programming and different topics that you can learn more about before you start to develop that yourself. So well done, OSC. You are awesome. I want to visit you again soon. Alrighty, the last um, different, oh my goodness, losing my words. Uh, the last case study, there we go, it's been a long day, um, is about visitor services. And I'm giving a shout out to um, one of my current workplaces, which is the Pump House Museum located in beautiful downtown Kingston on the waterfront of a great lake. And uh, yes, that's where I was today, working very hard. Um, this is an example of a small size municipal um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics kind of cultural history based institution. The Pump House is at its core, you know, all about STEM, but we do have cultural history exhibitions in our exhibition hall every once in a while. And um, we deal with many, many different topics. Um, we actually are uh, currently hosting an exhibition called Refuge Canada that's about the refugee experience um, internationally and once they do come to Canada as immigrants or as newcomers, I should say. Um, so that is definitely, you wouldn't necessarily immediately associate it with the pump house, but once you learn about the history of the place um, with water, it being, you know, built in a town that was essentially built by settlers in Canada, newcomers to Canada, um, it all starts to click and make sense. So it's a very interesting and um, dynamic space. Now what the pump house does, and I'm really fortunate to have a little bit of a hand in this as a museum assistant, um, is to do a lot to make the visitor services experience very, very positive. And when I talk about visitor services, um, I mean anything that the visitor experiences when they're checking in, when they're checking out, um, when they're moving throughout the space, whether it is for a program or an, an um, exhibition, just in general, um, anything that we can do to make the visitor experience better. You can also call this visitor experience if you want. Um, so we do a number of different things at the Pump House. Um, first and foremost on our website, I have it listed for you right there, is we do have a sensory friendly map that people can print off at home or even just look at to know what to prepare for and what to expect when they come to the Pump House. You can see we have a legend off to the side that covers all the different things you might experience, see, smell, hear, uh, and we even have a disclaimer under, you know, preparing for your sensory friendly visit, which I have a screen grab of there saying that there are things, there are areas specifically like the exhibition hall and train room that can be noisy. Um, just warning you right off the bat, if that's not something that you're really into or that impacts you as a neurodivergent person. So that is one thing that you can go and download right now if you wanted to on the Pump House's website. Um, another thing that we do is we do have kind of like a kind of similar to the RBCM's um, virtual tour preview. We also have a museum tour teaser, but it covers also the visitor 
experience um, and visitor services checking in and leaving the pump house afterwards as well. So um, I will play this video for you. Um, hopefully you can hear it. I did test it with Laura and this was filmed last year with the old exhibition, um, but please pay attention to how we make sure we cover everything uh, from stepping in the door and you know getting there to experiencing the museum and leaving. And it is about a minute and a half, so let's go. Hi there, welcome to the Pump House. My name is Melissa. I'm a curator here with the city of Kingston. Let's go check out Kingston's first water pumping station and what it used to have for the city and what it has now. But first, mask up. I'm Jessica. I'm here to make sure you can safely enjoy your visit. So now that you're all checked in, let's go check out the pumps. These two amazing water pumps brought water from Lake Ontario into Kingston Homes. These are fire tube boilers, a bit of a misnomer, as it wasn't fire in the tubes. This is an amazing work by artist Peter Apsel. The Drennan Chair was constructed by inmates of Kingston Penitentiary under the watchful eye of cabinet maker Samuel Drennan. Not only do we want to show you our collection, we also want you to have your say in what we collect and the stories we tell. Kingston's history is deeply rooted in the locomotive industry, from the Canadian Locomotive Company to the Grand Trunk Railway. You've only had a sneak peek at a few pieces in our collection. Visit us and we can tell you and show you so much more. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you soon. There we go. Oh, that's super cute. Um, so those were my colleagues at the pump house, basically explaining the general visitor experience when they come through and you actually walk through with them to see that, oh, there's some stairs. Um, there are some things that are probably going to be noisy, some things that are moving. I will say that the, the filming for this is a little fast, um, but I know they were trying to fit it into under two minutes. So um, I apologize if that was a, a little quick for you, but you can definitely go to YouTube on um, the city of Kingston's YouTube and uh, watch that again if you feel like you missed something. Um, Yes, so that is something that the pump house does. And then as well, um, I do not have it for you, but if you email me after or just reach out to me after, um, I do have what is called a social story. Um, just created actually by my students today. Very proud to have some fantastic students helping us out uh, with visitor services this year. But we have not only a social story for inside the museum, which we created a little while ago, but we also have a social story for outdoor experiences because we're currently doing walking tours um, to abide by COVID-19 safety regulations. A social story is essentially um, a little booklet similar to what I mentioned at the Ontario Science Centre that explains every single step of your visit. And we often provide these to families with youngsters who are um, neurologically divergent, who may be on the autism spectrum, or would just really appreciate a really clear breakdown of what their museum experience is going to be like. Uh, so we prepared one today uh, of our walking tours for a family that's coming tomorrow uh, with a young one who has ADHD and is um, who lives with ASD. So in these social stories, you just walk through every single step. No step is too small, right from hi, you're at the pump house. This is where you're going to go today to you are going to check in. Um, you will have a tour guide. You can ask them for help at any time. Um, you will visit um, the marine railway. You will not go in the water. Um, things like that, that just really clearly spell it out for people. Um, and also can give some really important safety tips, uh, such as, you know, remain with your tour guide at all times while crossing the street, things like that, um, that may seem very straightforward to neurotypical folks, but are incredibly helpful for uh, neurodivergent folks. So social stories are just incredible and I'm happy to share ours if you would like a template for your workplace. Um, my students also took like some very cute pictures and there's a photo of one of them with ducks being like, 
you may see ducks. Please don't touch them <laughs> um, because those ducks are incredibly friendly and they're definitely used to us. So um, that is a case study of visitor services at the Pomp House Museum. All righty, let's see if it's going to let me go to the next slide. Ha ha ha. Okay. Now we are moving on to activities and I feel like I'm doing fairly decent for time. So I have a couple planned for you this evening. The first one, I am going to need you to please get out your fabulous devices and go to menti.com. That's all you need to type into your fantastic device. And when you are prompted, please type in this code. I'm actually going to go to the page, the Menti page itself and start presenting. So that code is 61691584. It is at the top of the screen. And if you could make it there, that would be incredible. Hit the thumbs up when you do make it here. You do not have to participate. So no worries if you don't, but it might be fun if you do. So yes, menti.com and type in that code. Awesome, it looks like six people are here. And uh, you can jump in whenever, oh my goodness, now there's seven. I have no idea how many people are in this call right now. So I'm gonna assume that seven or eight is basically what we're gonna be. So Menti is kind of like a quiz participation tool and um, I'll be leading you through a couple of different activities with it. All right, you will get to pick a name or it will give you a name and it will also assign you a little icon uh, for your participation today. So players, you have been assigned an icon and uh, please pick your name. I will count down from five, four, three, two, one, and we are going to get started. So I do have a couple of questions for you first before we have uh, two general engagement um, tools. All right, we're going to be checking your knowledge and you need to answer fast. So do folks with acquired brain injuries fall under the neurodiversity umbrella? Yes or no? I talked about this near the beginning of the presentation. Everybody is brilliant because the answer is yes. These are not very difficult. It's late in the day. I didn't want to make it hard. So great job, everybody, on that knowledge check. Definitely folks with acquired brain injuries do fall under that neurodiversity umbrella. Next question. Again, you got to be quick. All righty, here we go. What terms can we use when discussing neurodiversity? Well, neurodiversity, of course, neurodivergence, neurodiverse, or neurodivergent. Pick your poison. Three seconds left, make a choice. And guess what? You are all right. And I love that everybody picked something different. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, that there are many different ways to talk about neurodiversity and many different kind of similar terms. So you can say neurodivergence, neurodiverse, neurodivergent, neurodiversity, they all refer to the same thing. So thank you for participating in that question. One more quiz question to check your knowledge. Here we go. Once again, answer fast if you can. What is an example of incorporating neurodiverse friendly aspects into a public program? Is it A, use one teaching style, B, make a social story available, or C, incorporate many components? Alrighty. Fantastic. A lot of you chose make a social story available. Yes. Using one teaching style isn't necessarily um, neurodiversity friendly because it only offers one way to participate in a public program. So it's not exactly friendly. Making a social story is incredible. Incorporating many components is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, I think the important thing is, is it, it's not entirely incorrect. It's kind of correct. Um, as long as the different components that are included you know, there's not like an overwhelming sense of choice. 
because that does make it a little bit tricky for neurodiverse folks to engage and focus in on what you are offering. So thank you all. That was awesome. All right. So leaderboard, let's just check out how people are doing or how people did, I should say. Becca, well done. Kelsey following up and Sierra in third. Congratulations, Becca, who was a volcano. <laughs> That is amazing. Take a screen grab of that if you want. Well done. Okay, so now we're gonna do some general engagement questions. I'm curious to know what you think, what area of museum work will be easiest to implement strategies for neurodiverse visitors? So you get to rank these, and again, this is not all museum jobs, definitely, but you get to rank these and let me know what you think, um, how you, think about these six things like what will be easiest is it digital experiences what would be hardest is it visitor services oh that's fantastic everybody was so fast so it looks like everybody oh oh there's some there's some more things happening it's going to adjust as more people participate so the more people who share their ranking it will change I wanted to ask this question and have you all see the results as people participate and rank and share their answers, because I think it'll help build a little bit of camaraderie and understanding about what are some of the, the first things, like easy wins that you can incorporate at your workplace um, when it comes to making, making your workplace, making your museum uh, more neurodivergent friendly. Oh, this is very cool. A lot of people are thinking visitor services. Yeah. I mean, you do get like a little bit biased the more you see people participate and then you think, yeah, yeah, I think visitor services. <laughs> very cool. I'll give people a couple more seconds to share if they like, but it does look like visitor services is first, followed up by education and public programs, then uh, digital experiences and exhibitions tied for third communications and marketing next and collections management uh, there at the bottom. Awesome. Thank you very, very much. And lastly, I did want to ask, how do you feel about your capacity to better plan for and welcome neurodivergent museum visitors so far before we do a couple other activities to help solidify your learning? And the more people who vote uh, will kind of change this bar a little bit. Or it may stay at four if everybody feels like pretty good so far. I, I don't hate that. That is for sure. And it looks like everybody's feeling pretty good. Awesome. We're all on the same page. This is beautiful. Okay, wonderful. Well, that is Menti. And I see we are getting on in time. So I'm going to move us right along. Oh, 4.1. I love it. <laughs> we went up by a point one. All right. Fantastic should be able to get out of this. Lovely. All right, so that was Mentimeter. Thank you all so much for doing that. Okay, so now we're going to look at the four areas that I covered in the case studies and just kind of do a couple of quick yes or no's, A or B type of questions. When we're talking about communications, marketing, and digital experiences, I have the group on or the list on the left of your screen and another list on the right. Um, the list on the left is talking about different ways that you can create communications, marketing and digital experiences and so does the right. But there's definitely a difference in the two. The left has things like important information only, consistent sound or volume, mild and predictable movements, sans serif font, different forms of engagement, slow to moderate changing images or lights. And then the right hand side has things like one format of engagement, fast movements, strobing images or lights, um, intricate details only, serif font, A or B, left or right. Um, I don't have access to the chat. So if someone wants to just unmute themselves, if they want, I'll give you a couple seconds and say whether you think um, the left side list or the right side list is more neurodivergent friendly. It is tricky. We're getting a lot of answers for left. 
left. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Laura. That's really helpful. Yes, absolutely. The left side is the yes, please side and the right side is the no thank you side. So I wanted to lay out some specific examples to help you understand some of the things I was talking about even more in depth. All right, now we're going to talk about exhibitions and I know again the love letter to Canadian museums. I have at the top the Canadian Science and Technology Museum and at the bottom an exhibition that was at the Canadian Museum of History. Both of these are located in the greater capital region in Ottawa, Ontario slash Gatineau, Quebec. There's a river that separates them and I'm wondering whether you think the top image, the Science and Tech Museum, um, is more neuro neurodivergent friendly or whether you think the bottom image, that exhibition, which was called Vikings, um, if that one is more neurodivergent friendly. Top or bottom? And again, Laura, you can prompt what's being said in the chat or someone can just shout it out. We have one person saying depends on the person. Ooh, nice. That's excellent. Really good. I know this one is definitely tricky and it's very hard to capture the essence of an exhibition just with a photograph. And I do apologize for that. It is true. It does depend on the person, but I would say in general, better lighting is definitely better. Um, you can see that there are different ways of engagement there's things on the floor, there's wayfinding up top, there's clearly defined areas on the floor. And there definitely seems to be, I mean, both of them have very well defined paths, but there just definitely seems to be a more neurodivergent friendly and welcoming space at the Science and Tech Museum. Whereas the Vikings exhibition, I've been to both. Um, I found that exhibition very hard just because it was dim, a lot of text, um, and just a little bit hard to kind of find my way through, whereas the Science and Tech Museum does navigation and exhibition experience very, very well. Um, I really particularly like that there's interpretation going on top to bottom of the room. That's just so helpful, um, depending on where someone is at. And if they just, you know, they need to find a quick exit, it's very easy to figure out where they are in the space. So I'm going to let that person who made that comment get a gold star because that was definitely an excellent answer. But at the same time, I think the Science and Tech Museum edges out ahead just a little bit more here. So two more of these types of activities. Um, the first column on the left hand side is different ways to engage with education and public programs and then the same on the right hand side but I'm wondering which one you think is more neurodivergent friendly, left side or right side? The left side talks about large group sizes, um, unexpected changes, temperature variations, varying floors and terrain, standing only or sitting only. And then the right hand side talks about things like capped group sizes, climate controlled or weather dependent activities, some downtime, predictable terrain, um, seating options, so different ways to move about the space and be in the space. What are people's immediate kind of knee jerk thoughts? Is the left side more neurodivergent friendly or the right side? We have folks saying right, the right side. Excellent. Thank you so much again, Laura. I should have told you I was going to do this, but you're doing a wonderful job. Um, yes, the yes please side is the right side and the no thank you side um, mostly is, is the left side. So making sure that you're laying it out for people very clearly and also having some control for the situation 
but then offering some flexibility in that controlled situation, it is a fine balance. And that's why I definitely encourage you to talk to professionals before planning things for neurodivergent visitors, particularly with education and public programs, because the way in which people learn um, and the different ways in which their environment can impact their learning experience, it's incredible. Like the brain is fascinating and neurodivergent brains are definitely even more fascinating. I'm just a little bit biased. And lastly, talking about visitor services. I have two photos here. Um, again, I know Canadian museums. Um, the top one is the entrance, the immediate visitors entrance at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa. And then at the bottom, is the Canadian War Museum also in Ottawa. I lived in Ottawa for four years, so I'm sorry, really biased to Ottawa. Um, but I'm wondering which one you think is easier for neurodivergent folks to navigate. Is it the Canadian Museum of Nature at the top or is it the Canadian War Museum at the bottom? looks like it is unanimously the top option <laughs> that's amazing yes i was giving you folks an easy win tonight definitely i do really like the canadian war museum because it's just like it is such a unique space but there is very limited signage it is not necessarily clear where to go when you first walk in it is a huge overwhelming space that causes a lot of echoing um, it can be a bit dim and it's just not very visitor friendly. As soon as you go in the front doors of the Canadian Museum of Nature, you're immediately, I mean, I don't wanna call them like, um, like a runway, but you're almost kind of channeled right into admission. And right away, you can see that there's signage demonstrating what's going on in the building, where you need to go. And then there's someone immediately there to help you. Uh, and answer any of your questions and help get you checked in, which is huge for neurodivergent folks because expectations are very clear right from the get-go. So well done, everybody. Thank you for, for letting me know what I already knew and that's that you were all brilliant. Alrighty. Now, one of the last couple of things that we are gonna do tonight uh, before we wrap up with resources is go to Padlet and this time, I'm going to actually drag and drop this link into the chat and whoever is able to meet me there, that would be awesome. So basically um, you are just going to, can I go to the chat? Oh, I'm, I might have to stop sharing really briefly. Oh, I can go to the chat right here. Awesome. There we go. So there is the link for the Padlet. If you could please kindly meet me there. Padlet is basically a kind of like a sticky note type of um, uh, platform um, that I have set up to kind of look like a blueprint because I want um, this entire presentation to be a bit of a blueprint for you all in terms of how you're moving forward with your learning. And what I would love for people to share is even just one thing that they can do tomorrow to plan for neurodivergent museum visitors. The ways in which you participate, um, or the only way in which you participate, is you create a new post-it by clicking the pink circle that is, looks like a plus in the bottom right-hand corner. It turns into a little pen. Um, and you can just click that, or you can also double click anywhere. You can drag files in, paste from a clipboard, doesn't matter. But um, I thought it'd be really cool for people to share their ideas here right away and also ping some ideas off of each other or popcorn different ideas off of each other um, because you never know what somebody else is going to think of that may help you. I'm already seeing that sensory maps is a hit. Thank you, that's awesome. And I'm definitely happy to share um, the pump houses if that would be helpful to you. So you just know in general what we have in the legend of that, but um, this is fantastic. I can see there are people saying that they want to communicate with their coworkers to get the morning session for autistic folks back. Yes, I love it. Um, accessibility guides, that is brilliant. I really do like that um, because those can be a whole bunch of different things and look like different things depending on what communities you're wanting to serve better. 
I like this a lot. Uh, social stories. Yes, definitely. That's incredible. Um, I'm definitely thinking that people are getting a better idea about what it's like to um, walk through a museum with neurodivergence in mind. Definitely all the comments that you are making 100% show me that. So thank you so much. This is brilliant. All right. I love this so much. I think I know for myself, even though I'm doing some of this work already, um, I definitely want to build more um, neurodivergent friendly components into our exhibitions. Our current one, Refuge Canada, is a traveling exhibition, so we didn't really have that much opportunity. But next year, we're doing a transportation exhibition, I believe. And I think there are so many opportunities for neurodivergent friendly experiences in that exhibition. We're making it in house, so why not start right now to build some of that into the work that we're doing? Oh, this is super duper cool. Thank you so much, folks, for, for jumping in there. Um, if you want to, you can continue to write and you can also keep this link and refer back to this Padlet. I'm just going to leave it up public. So feel free to share it with people in your workplace. Um, that is definitely not a problem with me. Alrighty, so let's start to wrap up for tonight. Thank you for being on the Padlet. I did want to share a bunch of different resources with you uh, before we finish tonight, because I appreciate that learning in this area is going to be very ongoing. So whether you're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or just want to simply check out some cool organizations, the possibilities are endless. And what I have up on the screen is like just dipping your toe into the pool. Um, on Twitter, there is a wonderful account called at Sensory Muse. And this person actually started the hashtag, hashtag Muse Dis, uh, where they talk about um, differently abled and neurodivergent folks in museums specifically. So please follow them. Um, absolutely wonderful. I want to say that their name is Lindsay Gottwald, but don't quote me on that. Just big shout out to at Sensory Muse. On Instagram, there's a big neurodivergent community on Instagram, and these are some of my favorites. Um, at Life and Autism World is very me-me, um, but it has helped me understand um, folks with ASD so much better, especially because my uh, brother-in-law um, has ASD and I've just, it has increased my knowledge hugely to kind of get to step into the mind um, of someone with ASD through that account. There's also another brilliant one called at autism underscore unmasked. And then for uh, vertigo, because I know we kind of um, looked at ASD and vestibular issues a bit more specifically in this presentation. I do want to give a shout out to at Dizzy Cook. Um, she cooks specifically for folks with vestibular issues and she also talks a lot about her vestibular migraine issues. So um, Alicia is awesome. And then at the Vertigo Doctor just has so many cool resources for folks dealing with uh, vestibular difficulties and disabilities. So um, there's so much going on, on Instagram. Go and explore, have fun. On YouTube, I love um, these two uh, accounts specifically. Special Books by Special Kids uh, does interviews with disabled and neurodivergent people. I have no idea how many videos they have at this point, but basically any type of neurodivergence or neurodiversity or disability that you might think of, they've probably interviewed someone uh, living with what you're thinking of. So please go check them out. Um, that has really opened my eyes to different types of neurodivergence out there and has helped me learn a lot about people um, experiencing different mental illnesses as well. Absolutely wonderful. And then a wonderful person named Tia, um, who does live with an invisible injury, uh, has a, an account called Living with an Invisible Injury and she explores the various aspects of this topic. So, um, Again, YouTube is similar to Instagram. There's so much out there and a lot of disability friendly and positive folks talking about different types of neurodivergence and disability. So please do go and explore on there as well. And then finally, there are tons of organizations and I really would encourage you to maybe be like the Ontario Science Center and partner with a particular neurodivergent based um, or focused organization in doing your work. Um, like for example, Autism Speaks. I believe they are USA based in New York 
And then there's also the vestibular disorder association or VITA for short. Um, honestly, I don't know where I would be on my vestibular journey without them because they are incredible at providing information and advocating for folks with vestibular issues. So uh, there's so much good stuff out there and please go find it. I just wanted to give you a starting point. So we are now at the end of the presentation. I know that I went a little bit long and I do apologize for that. I just had so much I wanted to share with you and a lot that I wanted you to engage with. So if this was a little long, I get it. Um, but thank you very, very much for being here. I wanted to share my email, my website, my LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram on this page because I would love it if you wanted to follow up with me later. But I'm pretty much the only Madeline Smolars you're going to find really anywhere on the internet. So <laughs> hopefully you can find me pretty easily if you do have questions or do want to follow up afterwards. But um, thank you very, very much to NEMPN for having me for allowing there to be a session on neurodivergence. We don't talk enough about it. And uh, it really is encouraging to me that you all are here wanting to learn about it. And um, I'm proud to have presented on this. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And hopefully if you have any questions, I can try to answer them for you. So thank you so much. Thanks, Madeline. Um, we do have a couple of questions that folks have dropped in the chat. So I think we'll just start with those. Um, so one question from Kelsey, um, the pump house video has quite a few fast forwarded sections. Uh, and then they say, I'm assuming that it was done to keep it short, but has there been any feedback on those sections of that video? And were those sections perhaps difficult for visitors? Definitely, thank you so much for that question. Yes, um, we did get feedback that it was a little fast. And actually just this evening, we published a, a focused sneak peek of one specific room at the pump house that is much slower and easily digestible. And I think that's how we're going to um, approach these types of videos in the future, make them smaller, more bite-sized and focus on maybe just one aspect of the experience or one room so that it doesn't have to go so fast <laughs> because yeah, you kind of, your head starts to spin a little bit as you're going through that one. And so there's definitely been learning on our part just in the year since we've done that video. Great, thanks Madeline. Um, and then another question uh, from what you've experienced, uh, what have been the easiest or most welcome to changes for neurodiverse visitors and employees? Ooh, most welcome changes. Honestly, I would just say have some sort of neurodivergent friendly messaging on your website even. I think that in itself, like going to the, for example, the pump houses um, uh, website and you go to visit, there's like an accessibility bar right away that you can click on that talks about different accessibility needs and how we're striving to meet them. I think that in itself makes someone feel so seen and so welcome when they do come to the site because clearly there's been thought by that institution and um, a lot of care put into that messaging. And so clearly when you go to the site, you're going to be encountering people who, who give a darn. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Um, and then just quickly, we had a comment um, that um, it says, I'd advise folks to look at what autistic people have written about Autism Speaks before considering partnering with them. Um, I've heard similar whispers, so I didn't know if, if you knew about that, Madeline, if you wanted to add to that or comment on that. I had heard a little bit. Um, I haven't worked with them specifically myself before. So thank you very much for uh, the, the person who raised that point about Autism Speaks. I should say that when you are going to partner, of course, no matter what you are doing, do your research on the organization that you're going to partner with. And all the better if you talk to your museum colleagues and other institutions and hear from them 
what their experiences were like with different organizations. Um, I know that we have worked at my workplace with Autism Ontario and they've been absolutely fantastic and we were fortunate to be kind of forwarded their information by another institution who had worked with them and had a great experience. So lean on each other and um, find it from your either your coworkers or your colleagues in your region, um, what they have done and what their experience has been like. Yeah, yeah, good advice. Anytime you're partnering with anybody, better, better do the research, do the homework. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, well, that's all that we had in the chat, but I also invite anyone who wants to ask their question in person, uh, so to speak, if you want to unmute yourselves, you are welcome to do that. I know this was a lengthy one, and that's <laughs> totally okay. Uh, thank you all so much. I appreciate the, the kind comments. Well, anything you wanted to add, Madeline, just uh, while we're finishing up? Honestly, um, I just, I'm very, very thankful to you all for being here. I know some po folks have popped in and out, which is totally okay. That's actually like a very good thing uh, when you're doing something because you should be able to invite people to pop in and out as they feel comfortable. Um, but I will just really um, quickly, oops, there we go, um, toss my email in the chat. If anybody does want to follow up with me afterwards, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Um, it is m.c as in cat dot s-m-o-l-a-r-z at gmail.com. So please don't be afraid to reach out if there's anything that I mentioned that you want to follow up on um, or if you have questions. Um, but yes, I'm very appreciative to NEMPN and for all of you for being here and hanging out for a little bit longer than I had intended. Um, but I had planned for 75 minutes. So hey, this isn't <laughs> too darn bad <laughs> for a Wednesday night. Yeah, no, you did great. I thought this was excellent. Um, I loved the little activities that you had in there. I think those were very engaging and got us all thinking. So I thought it was fantastic. Um, and uh, just to remind folks, uh, this was recorded. So if you came in a little late or you had to pop out and pop back in, no worries. Um, it'll all be up on our YouTube soon um, with captioning. Um, and uh, also these slides, um, Madeline has kindly offered to make the PDF available. So if you would also just like the slides handy, feel free to email me and or her um, and we can make sure that you get those too. Um, and I would just like to thank Madeline again. Thank you so much um, for volunteering for this presentation. Um, I learned a lot and I know that everybody else did too. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Stay safe and healthy and I'll see you soon. <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody.